Fragments of silicon has not, surprisingly, melted over the last two days. I will vigorously uh, rebuff that, that statement because I live in Florida. <laughs> it is degree weather and fucking humid um, pretty much all the time. So It never you know. stops. Yeah, yeah so. but we haven't melted. We're all still here. The show is going on. We're not dead. <laughs> it just feels like you've m- melted. It was 95 here yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's and funny. I live in Maine. <laughs> How humid was it? Huh? How humid was it? Probably ballpark ninety percent. Okay, that's fairly fucking humid. Because it's been one hundred percent humidity here for the past fucking week. Yeah, I, I don't check the humidity all the time, but I do live right next to the ocean, so it's usually pretty high. Mm. Anyway, welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon. I'm your host, Adam. Joining me, as always, is the regular crew. Uh, Mac is not here this week. Uh, apparently, For reasons. Yeah, he did not drop any reasons to us, but he's got reasons. Mm-hmm. And he says he's going to be here for Last News Desk, so all we can do is take him at his word. Um, as far as we know... Yeah, Last news day is still on the schedule. Um, that mine. Let's get to the news. Twilight, why don't you start us off this week? Uh, well, it's been hot here as well, so there's also been some rain to give us some relief, so that's good. Uh, and that, of course, caused some humidity, but it's been mostly rain for the most part. Yeah. But anyway, um, during the weekend, uh, well, actually, during last week, uh, the landlady's uh, daughter had come in, and uh, who's in real estate, um, and uh, she uh, had come around checking out to see how everything was in the in the community that is a uh, is the places that she owns, like where I live and such. And uh, she actually helped me out with um, getting this lighting system um, that um, that's um, by the uh, walk in the yard. Um, uh, repaired and set back up so I could see how to um, see the walk at night if I need to go out to my car and such, which I appreciate um, quite a bit. So she, she and her husband also brought their two Great Danes uh, <laughs> that ran around the yard. They don't really hate the dogs, though. Well, one of them is, actually. <laughs> um, that was kind of fun to mess around with them a little bit. Um... So yeah, then uh, work's going fine. And, um, nothing much is actually gone on there, and yeah, um, so uh, not much else in daily life news. So um, gaming wise, uh, Mac Care and I um, have continued the uh, Overwatch sessions on Monday, and uh, we've once again did the uh, Mystery Heroes thing and. Which was fun. Uh, I think we plan on going back to normal stuff um, um, this coming Monday. And yeah, I've been playing some of uh, my game for Sunday, and that's about it. All right. All right. Y'all, it's you're up. Uh, I said we didn't melt over the last few days, but it's been a was a very near thing. It's been extremely unseasonally hot. Today, thankfully, was a, li- a bit cooler, and it's supposed to get cooler after tonight, but I uh, have not really accomplished much of anything productive over the last three or four days. Um, aside from Pathfinder on Sunday went pretty well because we were in the basement, and then MS Saga with back went okay because, thankfully, I got my air conditioner in my room installed. Usually I don't do that until, like, 
early June, but uh, it seemed like a good idea, and it's been backed up, so that's good. I mean, it is early June, so right on schedule? No, I meant early July, sorry. Okay, that makes more sense. I, until, it gets, until it gets to be, like, the hottest part of the season. But this year is supposed to be hotter than usual, so that should be fun. Um... Yeah, video game wise, Emma Saga continues apace, and uh, yeah, I'm trying to. I played a little bit of my game for this week and need to do a bit more, and uh, still been keeping up the usual amount of Pokemon and uh, did a little bit more of Age of Calamity, but that takes a lot more direct attention. So, mm-hmm. uh, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah, mostly just uh, been been nobody can functionally hot. So, <laughs> and I I know that feeling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Thankfully, the office does have air conditioning. Mm. Anyway, um, so Betty, you're a go. Um, well, the big thing over the weekend is I have a new headset. So if you're wondering why I sound different. Surprise! <laughs> I got the um, Razor Kraken Ultimate, and this one's nice because I can independently adjust the Skype volume that's coming in. Me? So, yay! And, yeah, um, we also, um, I think yesterday, checked out a new... Um, game store here in town that has like video games, board games, card games, and it was kind of nifty. I may see about going there, you know, more often. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. As far as gaming goes, I picked up um, Azure Striker Gunvolt Pack on PS4. Mm-hmm. And just been kind of totaling away on that because we lost internet for a while today. Now, is that just the first two still? I think it's just the first two. Well, I mean, Azure Striker Gunvolt 3 hasn't come out yet. Yeah, but uh, Luminous Avenger X has. Hmm. Which is a spinoff. So I didn't know if they could be packaging that together. I didn't expect them to be, but it's possible. Fair enough. And. Um, we are potentially talking about switching the uh, for Final Fantasy fourteen raids. We are potentially switching from Tuesday to Monday, just because one of our raid team members' work schedule. They're not at home till like literally time. It's about about time to wrap up. So. Mm. adjustments need to be made so that's going to be fun mm. and yeah just kind of getting ready for the hell that is E3 <laughs> alright um, there's nothing else it's my go Yep. Um, you know, as mentioned before yeah it's hot here uh, how could it not be hot and muggy, it's the, because it's the rainy season. It's literally rained every day for the past week, and that'll probably continue because summer here is when it gets wet. Um, elsewise, um, just been planning stuff. You know, um, planning the E3 schedule. Um, just sawing that down to the core stuff that we want to cover because. Well, this E3 is, you know, lacking some players, and also there's more events going on. You know, like there, there's all the Summer Game Fest stuff. Um, there's the Gorilla Collective stuff that we're not covering. Just a lot, you know, it's a hangover from, you know, the hell year. Um, <laughs> Not sure how much of this stuff is going to, you know, linger in 2022, but in 2021, you know, E3 is back. Um, though it looks like EA and Sony are going to be permanent non-players in that affair. Um, for today or for just for this year, or are you saying going forward? 
going forward. Like, remember, they dropped out. Sony famously dropped out in what 2019 or you know 2020, yeah. so, something like that. Whatever year, uh, yeah, yes. And EA, like they've done events, but technically that was not an E3 thing. That's always been off campus. Mm-hmm. Uh, and outside of that, planning the next season of Fragment Silicon, uh, we're up to August. Like first oh. bookings there have happened. Like, including one I'm really interested in seeing how it plays out. Uh, I'm like, it, it's, well, it let's, okay, it's a newly formed branch of a major entertainment company, let's say. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was kind of surprised that they put out games, too. <laughs> um, but um, more on that later. Yeah. Um, Anyway, and yeah, as far as games go, already done with um, my game for the week. Um, hint: it's gonna be it's gonna be on the worst list. <laughs> and, I, and the thing is, it's not anything the game itself was doing. It's just I could not deal with such an unoptimized Unity game. Fine. You know them. You hate them. They take fucking ten minutes to load. Uh, Sounds about right. Yeah. So, you know, just for that, it's a it's in the fucking no pile. I'll be up front here. Um, which is a, a bit of a shame, but you know, when the and there's no fucking reason that that game should be having such load times when it looks like it does. Like, hey, sometimes games, games are popular or badly optimized. Sometimes games have ass backwards control schemes. Some yeah, this is. Both. Yeah, this one is definitely unoptimized. Uh, you know, I'll be up front. So, uh, you know, it's like I put two hours into that. You know, I'd say at least a quarter of that was load times. So, um, outside of that, um, got inspired for this week's topic by playing Saints Row Four. Um, been playing quite a bit of Saints Row. You know, I was hoping Saints Row 5 was going to be at E3 or, you know, one of the events, but looks like no, or at least not at the publisher's event. Still could show up at, like, Microsoft. You know, that's how these things work. Anyway, and yeah, that's uh, my news for the week. Um, No, Mac hasn't popped up yet. Um, You know, he said most likely in private, but looks like the likely happened, so... Merrily, we shall move along to the interview portion of the broadcast. And joining us, um, as always, um, given a few months, is John Pickett of Manga Gamer. Hello, it's good to be back again. It's always good to have you. Uh, let's see. Um, so I suppose we should start with your latest release, um, which hmm. is, if I'm recalling correctly, is Funbag Fantasy 3 IF. Yeah, 3 if. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess the first question there is, um, does the if stand for something? So the when uh, Lawful originally developed Funbag Fantasy 3, uh, they originally released one version, and then later on they did a remake of it that added uh, several more arcs and several more heroines that you can pursue. And so 3 if is that remake and we chose to localize that so that uh fans can get the full experience makes sense but um like still not really answering the question that is you know does the if stand for something for in universe is just something the publisher attached it it's basically it's if because like i said the story was remade so they tweaked a couple tidbits in the storyline to accommodate for all the new content so it's if in that sense of it's a quote-unquote separate storyline but not really like 80 to 90 percent of it's the same okay i get i get it so it's like what if yeah yeah okay and like how much was added like how many girls can you romance and what not uh, it added the 
several of the goddesses from the underworld and the uh, ability to pursue several of the uh, goddesses in Olympus, like Aphrodite and Athena. Okay. And it's just um, content additions, no uh, adjustments to any sort of editing. I mean, yeah, the, all the adult content is still there. Okay. If anything, there's more in, the, in this version that we, and that's why we chose it. Right. Um, and in terms of the, I guess for lack of a better term, the Fun Bag Fantasy franchise, <laughs> I'm like, is this a continuation of a story? Is this a standalone thing? Is, is it a new continuity? No. Yeah. So in terms of the Fun Bag Fantasy franchise, uh, Fun Bag Fantasy 3 is the first to actually be um, an entirely separate story. It still continues a lot of the themes and the concepts of Fun Bag Fantasy, and that's why it's the same franchise. Um, but in Fun Bag Fantasy 3, we leave the world and the setting of Funback Fantasy 1 and 2 behind and enter into a brand new setting that is based on ancient Greece and ancient Rome, where instead of playing as sort of a normal, uh, you know, mundane mortal human like you do in 1 and 2 with Funback Fantasy 3, you actually play as the forgotten god of breasts. Well, then. I'm like, I have a hard time believing that that's a god that would ever be forgotten about. But. <laughs> oh. But. Yeah, so he, the story starts with uh, one village in trouble, like, summoning him to aid them. And after using, like, you know, as a god, he's very weak since he has no worship. But he manages to help them, and as reward, they give him a tit job, and that sort of kickstarts his path to regain full divinity and rise uh, up to Mount Olympus. <laughs> oh, it, okay. Try not to corpse people. Like, uh, yeah. But, okay. So does this god have a name, or is, is that kept on the back? Uh, his name is. His name is. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It's um. He does have a name. I'm trying. Julianus. Yeah. Julianus. Um. Yeah. J U L I N A S. All the names are Greek and Roman, so aside from the goddesses, it can be a little hard to remember. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to figure out if that's a pun on anything. It's come to mind, but granted, Greek and Latin were not my thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, so how much of a character is Julinas? Like, um, does he I, have a face? Does he have a voice? That kind of thing? Uh, and he's not, like the previous uh, Fun Back Fantasies, he does not have a voice. He doesn't really have a uh, face either in any of the CGs, but he is obviously he's the main character. The the things that he does in the storyline, uh, you know, he saves women and they reward him with breasts and breast worship. Uh, so a lot there's plenty of you know sex and breast oriented sex from that, and of course that enhances his divine power and boosts his divinity, and as more people come to worship him, yeah, he grows in power and grows to be more of a player in the world and history. Right. Um, so, on the flip side of things, who are the various women that you can romance? Uh, so there's one of the early ones is Paya... Uh, she's, um, one of the girls, the, she's the first girl to become a priestess of the main character. There's, um, Ajura, who's the, 
uh, goddess of war and minotaurs. There's Venus. There's Athena. Um, he starts off in the underworld with Medusa, but Medusa doesn't get her root until the DLCs or the um, sorry, not DLC, the sequel to Fun Back to Fantasy 3F is when Medusa gets her root. Huh. Um, and then there's, uh, I want to say at least two or three, maybe four more along the way. Sounds but those like, four are sort of the main ones. Sounds like a fairly healthy lineup. Um, yes. Now, we have been using the term romance quite euphemistically, but <laughs> is that the, well, is that the overall point? I mean, yes, fucking is going to be part of the equation, but are you actually trying to, you know, make one of these goddesses or demigods your lover? There are different endings, um, kind of like in the original uh, Funback Fantasies where you can uh, shoot off to uh, different endings with each of the main heroines based on your choices, but the sort of canon ending is more of a harem ending. That's pretty fitting with actual Greek mythology. Like, granted, oh, even yeah. more fitting was just fuck him and leave him. Like, ask, <laughs> ask Zeus about it. He's yeah, Zeus dude, never had sex with anyone as a person. Yeah. So, not you know, like actual Greek mythology is quite the thing. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, um, so you mentioned there's a sequel to this one. Um, what is is that? Fun Bag Fantasy Four, or is that uh, like Fun individ- Bag Fantasy Four is a different game that was recently announced in Japan, if I remember correctly. Um, but no, the, the sequel to this, I want to say it's like Artemis's arrow and Medusa's something else. And it basically just adds a little extra to the story of, uh, fun bag fantasy three that lets you have a root with the, uh, underworld goddess Medusa and obviously the Olympian goddess Artemis. Right. So is that like a standalone spinoff thing or is that like more like a second revision to this game? Um, it's kind of like a standalone sequel. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Right. Is it? Yeah, it's a little bit more of a spin-off. Mm-hmm. And um, do you have any plans on localizing that? Uh, we're not that we don't have any plans at present, but obviously. Part of why we chose Fun Mag Fantasy 3 if was to keep that possibility open. Mm-hmm. So, you know, once we see how well Final Fantasy 3 does over time, you know, then maybe we'll be able to make some firmer plans and stuff there. Noted. Like, also phrasing. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, um, and how has uh, Fun Mag Fantasy 3 been faring so far? It's been faring quite well. The series obviously has a lot of fans, and so we've got a lot of repeat and comeback uh, customers that are very happy with it. Good to know. Good to know. Like, um, is this one on Steam or not? I believe it is on Steam, but it's, yes, it is on Steam, but it's behind the adult wall. That makes sense. I, I, I really don't think this is the kind of uh, visual novel that uh, yeah, you can no. sanitize. But yeah, it is on. It is available. Final Fantasy III if is also available uh, on Steam, fully uncut. So, um, just moving forward here, um, talk about some third-party releases like Nakadashi Banzai Five, Arc of mm-hmm. Artemis, and Explorer of the Abyss. Um, this, my first question here is, I, I don't think we've actually delved into this, um, is how do you go, or how does Manga Gamer go about uh, looking for 
you know, external visual novels to publish on your website. So, I mean, to some extent, it has, it's more we look at other, uh, we work with other publishers. So, like, Explorers of the Abyss mm-hmm. and is published by Kagura Games, which we've been working with and publishing, you know, really, we've been working with for uh, many years now. They're technically a localizer and a publisher of their own, so our relationship with them is more that of a retail outlet with Mm -hmm. another publisher. Mm -hmm. Um, And same with, like, Nakadashi Banzai 5, uh, Umesoft, the Japanese, if I remember right, that's the Japanese company hiring out the localizations. And so we've they approached us, and uh, we've been working with them. They publish to several others, several different sites. Ours is just one more storefront for them. So a lot of those uh, third-party titles follow in that vein, where we have a relationship with the publisher, and we serve as a retailer. Because obviously, you know, with adult entertainment, finding retailers and places to carry and provide your games is a big challenge. So, you know, it's a great service that we're very happy to provide. Indeed, indeed. And uh, is that a service that only applies to adult games? Or, you know, ha- have has anyone approached you with, like, an all-ages visual novel that they want on the Manga Gamer site? So, well... So we had, oddly enough, we had one instance where we were approached, um, but I, it was actually the uh, publishers for, I believe the title is called Key to Home, if you ever remember the controversy around that. Uh, not offhand. It was a game that was trying to get published on Steam, but was rejected because it deals with sort of the basically it deals with someone uh, kidnapping minors and so it, it dealt with that sort of touchy subject of the sort of abuse of minors and while it wasn't an adult title obviously Steam didn't want to touch it because of that and so they they tried coming to us to see if we would character it, carry it, and n- not surprisingly, our payment processor actually said no because people would assume it would be is an adult game if it was hosted on our website, and that was not the content in that could not fly as an adult. No, I can see their point of view on that. Um. And also Steam, if only just because, yeah, this is some, this is about as raw a subject matter as you can get. Yeah. We, like, we looked, we reviewed the game, and it's, it's actually a gen, it was actually a genuinely good game, and I'm kind of sad that it never found a proper outlet to be retailed. Well, I mean, but un, it's unfortunate that the circumstances around it. Right. I, I suppose. Do you know if that game came out at all? I don't recall offhand. I don't. I don't know. I don't think it ever did. I, I'm like, I can't even say if that's unfortunate or not because, once again, just the subject matter. It's not even a matter of, you know, inferring endorsing pedophilia it's like this is a subject matter that you have to get right or yeah could be actually harmful so yeah i'm not surprised that that didn't make it to release you know so yeah but and um also in that regard um do you just publish japanese born visual novels or have you also hosted you know, external Western developed visual novels as well. So we have hosted Western developed 
um, visual novels, as long as they're kind of in that anime visual novel style. We've worked with uh, Tsuki Ware is one such uh, Western publisher. They've done... Um, uh, they did one game about a cross-dresser and another about Yuri Fox Girls. Um, i trying to remember the titles. Critical Hit and The Tower of Five Hearts uh, were two of their bigger ones. And we've also... For a while, we carried titles from uh, Lupe Soft, which is another Western mm. visual novel developer. Yeah. Um, I remember one of those. Um, yeah. Mutiny. I don't remember that game. Yeah, Mutiny. We carried that and helped get that out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and is this a let's, uh, is this a business that um, just uh, because you're friends with these other things, or do you actively like look around for these uh, disparate visual novels? Uh, we do look around. Um, we don't have a whole lot of staff dedicated to looking for potential like third party and Western developer partners, so we. If I'm being fully honest, we have more success when uh, such developers approach us. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do, it is it is part of the business model, and we do encourage this interaction because uh, part, obviously part of our goal as a company is expanding and developing the market for these games as a whole. So being able to host and sell and promote and showcase these other titles that, you know, maybe we didn't necessarily work on ourselves, but that are still good quality titles, it helps expand that interest in general. It helps build, you know, the base. It helps more people find things that they'll be interested in, enjoy these kind of games, and just generally, you know, makes things better for everyone. All right. And uh, how often are you approached with um, various visual novels? It it comes and goes in spurts. We'll have, usually there'll be, like so far it's kind of been, we'll have periods where we're not really approached at all for months or years, and then we'll have like three or four people approach us like at once. Um, and currently for the past year or so especially most of our third party releases have been uh through existing clients our partners it's not really surprised given you know yeah given everything that's happened it's kind of hard for people yeah. to i mean you know on that note have you are there any plans uh for the convention circuit since we seem to be rounding the corner on the COVID plague? Uh, we actually do. Uh, so Otakon has announced that they are moving forward, and Anime Expo has announced that they are not. So our first convention of the year is going to be uh, Otakon this August in D.C. We're still waiting to hear more details back from them about how that's going to work like how many vendors there are. Uh, I think they recently published a policy on their website saying that they would not be checking vaccine status, but they would be mandating masks for all attendees. Um, So there's still a lot of development going on there since they weren't able to, you know, make that official declaration until basically this month. (laughs) And... It's only less than two months away. So right. Um, I mean, honestly, given conventions in general, having everyone wear a mask sounds good to me just on a general basis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm like, on the one hand, I'm not excited about the idea of wearing one for eight hours straight because it can be uncomfortable. On the other hand, it will be nice to actually come home from a convention without a cold for once. <laughs> without con plague. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm like, yeah, I like so many people just 
you know, because, you know, it, it's a convention. Yeah, um, it's, to some extent, it's just the price of being in that large of a crowd. But yep. it's fun. Uh, we'll probably all we'll probably have to change a couple of our things with our setup to accommodate things. Because I know for the past few years we've been building an enclosure at our Otakon booth to sort of keep all the adult content like sort of in a in you know contained room so people can browse it without us having to censor it. But obviously that's probably not something that's not something we're going to do with COVID being a concern because I, I, I don't think people would want to go into a thing like that this year. Um, and then in terms of conventions, the other one uh, that looks like it's actually still happening this year is going to be Anime New York in November. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's still time for that to change, right. but if it doesn't, we will be attending that as well. Okay. Well, it, like I said, it's you know, things are slowly but surely getting back to normal. Like, yeah. Um, anyway, I suppose uh, the last thing to talk about this time around is a recent license announcement, and that's Distant uh, Memor- 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 Memorato. 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 It's, a, it's Esperanto. Oh. Um. Because uh, Distant Memorajo is the sequel to the expression Amrilato. Right, right. Um, and is this a direct continuation? Yes, it is. The, it, the Distant Memorajo contains two uh, different stories. One that picks up immediately, sort of immediately at the end of uh, the expression Amrilato, where Rin and... Um, trying to remember names. <laughs> the uh, gray-haired girl are together, and it's they've hit that point in their relationship where Rin is starting to doubt her decision to stay in the world with Rin and others. Uh, Rin is having trouble. The the other girl is having troubles with one of her classmates in school. And so it deals with, you know, where the first one deals with, obviously, the blatant communication issues of language barrier, this part of the arc deals with the communication issues of trying to convey your feelings within a relationship and to, you know, keep that going. For those keeping score at home, Amrilato is Esperanto for relationship, particularly romantic. Memoracho is... uh, is Esperanto for souvenir or memento? Yeah, it, the memento is the one that this plays more on. I mean, really, they're pretty much the same concepts, just one is a yeah. little bit more uh, and the, Yeah. And then the second story in Distant Memorajo is a tale from before that focuses on the teacher who became a guardian for the other main girl in the story and it explores the story of how those two came together how the teacher became her guardian and that tale of the struggle to communicate between two people who are very different ages and very different stages in their lives i i Suppose I do have to ask about that second relationship that's fairly platonic. Is yeah, it? it is. It's it's not romantic. Uh, it's, like, it, it's parental, basically. Yeah, because I'm like, I know there are visual novels there where it would not be the case. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I have a lot of problems with those relationships. Um, you know, not just the obvious age gap, but also the power dynamics that can arise in such a relationship, but that's neither here nor there. Right, uh, that's not in this game. This game, is, it's a, it's the parental relationship. And also, for, for everyone keeping a score that cares, which is, I'm sure, just me, <laughs> in both the Japanese version and in actual Esperanto, the J is actually pronounced as a J and not an H or Y. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. I did not know that, so it is that it is distant memorajo. Memorajo. Okay. Memorajo. Oh, sorry, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I'm like not saying Esperanto you're bad expert, at this. I, I was. So. I was surprised. <laughs> I'm not I'm, an Esperanto expert, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, Esperanto, while being the world's most popular constructed language, is, 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 is that's not saying much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, that, that means it's more popular than Klingon. <laughs> I mean, you could make an argument against Long that because it's <laughs> popular Star Trek. But anyway, um, so um, getting back to Distant Memoraho here. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, how far along in terms of translation is this? So we're actually going to be opening pre-orders for that in about two hours tonight. Hmm, that's handy. Like, um, I guess along those lines, do you have a release date and or price in mind? Uh, it will be releasing on the 15th of July, and uh, I believe the price is going to be similar to uh, Amri Lato. I know... Memorajo is slated to be released on Steam as well. Mm-hmm. Was this one of the games you were, uh, like, um, Amarillo? Wasn't that one of the ones you were having problems with Steam, or am I thinking of another? No, you're right. Amarillo is the one that Steam was like, uh, this can't be on our platform because there's a scene of two girls bathing. <laughs> and even though it's a completely non-adult game and we had no problem getting it on the Discord store and GOG and other platforms. Uh, Steam did eventually, you know, go back on that after the commotion that it, their ban caused. So it, Amarillo is now on Steam again. And um, have you been running any problems with the sequel here? Not yet. I suppose I should cross my fingers. <laughs> but, sure. no, the as far as, yeah, the... Everything is going smoothly toward the release for that so far. I suppose along those lines, is there anything that would be of concern? Uh, no. I think at, there's one... I think want to say the worst scene in terms of that content. I think we see the teacher coming out of the bath with a towel in front of her. Covering up, like all but a little bit of her side hip. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, hopefully things work out much smoother this time around. Yeah. Hey. Right, um. So I think that's about it from me this time around. Um. Anything else from you guys? I think I'm good. I'm good. Sounds interesting. I'm good. Okay. Um, as always, John, it was lovely having you on our program. Yeah. Uh, it's always a good time talking. Uh, yeah. Let's see, as far as next time, uh, how does September 1st work? September 1st should be good. Okay. All right. So until then, as always, um, thank you for taking time out of your schedule. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if you want to experience the full manga gamer experience be sure to visit their website yeah and if uh if you guys if those of you listening now or later uh want to check our website out in about two hours from now we're going to be releasing uh john at the clock tower from liarsoft on our website and it'll be released on steam later tomorrow um so petty play us in the next segment Welcome to the topic of discussion. This week, we're talking about the Saints Row franchise. No, um, mainly because we're still, you know, we're still in pre-3, and I can't say nothing's been announced, but uh, that Battlefield trailer was 
just say just fucking CGI. <laughs> like, is the actual gameplay trailer showing up at the Xbox conference? So, because of course. Yay. Yeah. Um, so, anyway. uh, as someone who's only vaguely familiar with the franchise, uh, Saints Row is that one that started as kind of a relatively serious, um, what's the word, um, uh, GTA Grand, Theft Auto, Grand Theft Auto type game and then got very silly? Yeah, Saints Row has had a very interesting part. Now, I can't really speak on the first game because, um... The first game only came out on the Xbox 360. Like, seriously, there has been... There was no PlayStation 3 version. There was no PC version. Just Xbox 360. It, it came out in, like, the first year of that platform. And, you know, it seemed to have sold well enough to get a sequel, but not enough to get any fucking remakes or ports. Like... And so I can only speak to reputation on that one, but you know, Grant, uh, you know, Saints Row not only started off serious, but from what I understand, it was a fair bit more serious than Grand Theft Auto. Now, because yeah, Grand Theft Auto was always fairly uh, what's the word humorous. Like, granted, uh, you know, at least PlayStation Two era. Um, GTA 4 got a lot more serious. Just one of the reasons I didn't like it as much. Also, I because think I was going to say flippant about the tone of the crimes. Well, it, GTA could be a very goofy series of crimes. Like, mm -hmm. um, usually intentionally so. Like, it definitely knew, like, definitely uh, partakes in a lot of black humor. Let me tell you that. But, um, yeah. And Saints Row never really went that track. Um, like, I don't think they ever uh, invested in satirical radio stations. And that's, like, the biggest source of um, the satire in GTA games. You know, all these radio stations that parody... Um, uh, American radio media. Like, um, granted, that got less so starting with Vice City, because that's when they started really doubling down on the licensed music. Um, and that's definitely a legacy that Saints Row took, um, up until Gap to Hell, but so get there. But, you know, Saints Row, um, fairly serious. Uh, Saints Row 2 is when the, when the, Cracks started showing. Um, <laughs> make no like Saints Row Two. No, uh, Saints Row Two. I have on PC. The problem is I have Saints Row Two on PC. Because um, <laughs> Saints Row Two is infamous for its shitty PC port. Mm -hmm. I think they might have fixed that up, but. Um, yeah, I haven't endeavored to find out if that's uh, been the case with the Steam version. Um, once again, like, we're getting a remaster. We got a remaster of the third game, which is perfectly fucking fine. Like, but, you know, we don't get this for the game that never left the Xbox 360. Um, and the game that is legendary for fucking mangled ports. I'm like, you know... I'm assuming that it's because Saints Row the Third is the most popular of them, or sold the most. Like, there's got to be a reason that one got prioritized over all of the other Saints Row games. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you know, Saints Row Two. Getting back to the tone, like the tone there was still mostly serious, um, still mostly about you know front. Prime, although I think this is when, like, the Ultor Co Corporation comes into um, the field. Um, it's not just that they're a cartoonishly evil uh, corporation, though I repeat myself. Like, it's, they're also, you know, at least when they get to saying sort of very, very cyberpunky. Um, but 
Okay, um, getting back to my point about the tone. Um, there is one mission in Saints Row 2 that is fairly infamous, and that is the shit mission. Like, if you don't know it, it's quite literal. Like, you are um, driving and controlling a waste management truck, um, namely one that is literally filled with shit, and you spray it around. We're getting some weird static. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's you, Adam, or what. It, it was it was just doing the normal thing, but then... Okay, yeah, it's gone away now. There was a little bit of an electronic tone a second ago, so I wasn't sure if it was something unusual. Anyway. Um, so my point, you know, point is here, you know, it's a, you know, clearly this is less serious than Saints Row 1, considering that you're spraying shit around. And that really kind of sets the tone of where the humor will, you know, will flow. It's definitely got a more juvenile sense, although um, thinking about uh, the other Saints Row games, there's nothing quite like the shit mission in in the other Saints Row games. Because, you know... Um, the arc that takes place in Saints Row the Third, um, the you know the tone is in that game is where we start getting the mad 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 insanity that Saints Row is now known for, um, <laughs> and it only you know it it started in Saints Row Two, but you know what could they you know what could they do to elevate themselves above the um. You know, the shit mission? By making the Saints pop culture icons. Which is not that unusual. I mean, yeah, they're a street gang, but, um, you know, for lack of better terminology, rap music? You know? Like, mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, fuck, I remember where, where Snoop Dogg started out and where he is now. I'm not saying he was an actual gangster or anything, but, you know, he was quite famous for indulging in, you know, in the 90s was very shocking, you know, smoking weed. What a difference 30 years makes. And so, yeah, Saints Row takes that bent. But, you know, it still stays true to the roots of being, well, a GTA game. Like... Saints Row 4 is where we get, if nothing else, interesting. Is um, that the one where you can become president? Yes, that's the yes. one where you become president. But, oh, I almost uh, forgot about Saint. Um, yeah, the most important feature introduced from Saints Row 2 was the customization. And that is a thing that has continued, you know, to expand um, over the Saints Row games, the mainline one. Um, because Saints Row is pretty notable for not just having a character creation tool, but having a very robust in um, ways that other character creation tools do not. Like, this is a character creation tool that can acknowledge that um, minorities exist and gay people exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know? And starting, I want to say with like, uh, yeah, with Saints Row 2, you could also imbue gender. Don't think they've gotten to the non-binary yet, but I wager that's the thing that you could have in Saints Row 5. I'm expecting many, many gender options in that that game, just because that's kind of what they leaned into. Now, um, as it is, once again, still robust. You can, you know, you get not just skin colors um, from realistic minority to, you know, alien greens and blues and shit. Like, but also, you know, realistic hairstyles that aren't just like the three hairstyles white people know. You know, like, you know, fucking cornrows and afro and that and that kind of thing. It's more hairstyles around than just a few of them. Anyway, but yeah, Saints Row 4. Um, 
going back to play that it's interesting because um maybe also prescient uh given everything because i do remember this game causing quite the stir, stir because it's a it's a gta game where you don't really need to play in the style of gta um that is to say because you're in a simulation you very quickly gain superpowers like mm-hmm. you can super run and you can jump, you know, uh, tall leaps in a single bound. You can jump good. Whoa, I know Kung Fu. Not that specifically, but you can, uh, you can shoot, shoot fireballs and ice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as a consequence of that, not sure if it was intentional or not, you do not have to bother with cars uh, you know, after you unlock some stuff fairly quickly mm. on. I know I don't. Now, is it still Grand Theft Auto if you're just stealing the car to pick it up and throw it at someone? <laughs> Probably, but, you know, like, <laughs> if we're being honest here, like, are crimes even really happening? Because, you know, you're in a simulation, you're trying to fight off against evil aliens. Like, for a Saints Row game, you're pretty unabashedly the good guys. Pretty much. You know, like... It isn't like, say, Saints Row 3, where, yeah, you're battling an evil corporation, but you're still killing people. You're still killing rival gangs. Now, here, it's all aliens, and it's all computer data. Now, this, this is really some what measure is human. And in this case, not a lot of human. Now, hell, like, if anything... You know, you are entirely fucking justified in taking these aliens out because they blow up the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, my point is this, like, open world games have really moved away from the GTA template for the most part. Um, whereas, in, you know, even that was still. A case in 2015, though, that was definitely left so, considering things like Just Cause. Um, when you created a game that can top out Just Cause. Because, I'm like, also, you know, maybe the satire hasn't, has it either aged better or worse in the year of 2021? I'm honestly not sure. You know, because keep in mind, this game was released, you know, before the dark time. You know, the before the times. era of, they were very fucking dark times. Like, fair enough. I, you know, I would endeavor to not call that uh, the past four years anything else. Fair. You know, considering the stupid orange yam that was a president. Fair. Now, I can legitimately say that the Saints Row boss was a better president, no matter what. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. motherfucker, you know, he or she, however you want to, you know, designate that avatar, knew what empathy was. Gasp. You know, among other things, but you know, we can save the political talk for the political show. Um, anyway, but. Yeah, and other complaints about Saints Row 4 is, th- this is, um, you know, when we see Steelport, the map of Saints Row the III, uh, as a recurring setting, you know, and a lot of that has to do with um, Saints Row 4 was born out of a canceled DLC expansion uh, called Enter the Dominatrix, which, um, ironically enough, became DLC for Saints Row 4, but... You know, th- this was more born out of a s- expansion pack than a an, uh, completely original game. That's why it, it, you know, that's why it's like on the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 initially, and why it's so similar in its map structure to the previous game. And they would do this again for the standalone spinoff or the standalone expansion title, Get from Hell, like. Uh, um, yeah, this one definitely is that standalone expansion 
where it's shorter and slimmer than a mainline uh, Saints Row game. Uh, for example, like Gat from Hell, like you're not rescuing uh, Johnny Gat um, from Hell. You are Johnny Gat in Hell. It's a thing that happens in Saints Row 4. This is meant to be a coda to Saints Row 4. And um, not sure how it's going to set up Saints Row 5 because we don't actually know any details about Saints Row 5 yet. Um, but so it's hard to know which ending is uh, the actual canonical ending. Um, and Saints Row 4 um, up the ante again. Um, if nothing else, Saints Row 4 is, uh, you know, Saints Row is not afraid to experiment with new styles, just new maps that uh, they have problems with. Because, once again, uh, you got the Steelport map for the third time. Um, I guess a bit more understandable this time because it's a expansion pack thing. Um, though you can play it standalone, hence the, you know, the clunky title of standalone expansion. Um, and yeah, it, you know, it's Steelport, but it's in hell now. Um, and it's stripped out things like custom, you can't customize at all in this game. Outside of like maybe outfits, like even then, um, like you can't really go into any buildings. Like instead of weapon stores, there's just vending machines. Also, this game is, this game is actually more airborne than Saints Row 4. Um, how they do that? Angel wings. Yeah, you can actually fly in this game instead of just gliding for long distances. It actually makes a big adjustment in the collectibles. In Saints Row Flory, uh, 4, you've got these uh, clusters. In Saints Row um, Gat from Hell, you got all these orbs that are floating in the air. Also, for some reason, they made this a fairy tale. An actual fucking fairy tale with a storybook and everything. Hmm. Like I said, this series is fucking insane. Indeed. But it's in, you yeah, know. I guess that's really more what I meant by silly, is that it got really weird. Yeah. It, got really it did not stay being the same kind of game it was. No, <laughs> no. It, 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 like I said, it went in the opposite direction that GTA went. Like, GTA got a lot more serious. Um... I'm not sure how much that the, happened with GTA 5, because I haven't actually played GTA 5. I've never gotten around to picking that up. I don't know. I, I just had a really bad experience with GTA 4. Um, not just its tone, its graphics, its... Oh, God, the PC version of that is also fucking broken. But... And I don't think that one got fixed. But anyway, um, I guess... Also worth mentioning is the quasi spin-off hero shooter Agents of Mayhem in that it happened. I was about to say that was a thing, wasn't it? I think that's about what it was. Because yeah. it turns like it turns out going for a single player hero shooter is a bad idea. <laughs> or at least not a profitable one. Because Whatever would give yeah, you that idea. I mean Several things, but the, the failure of Agents of May Mayhem is one of them. Anyway, um, as far as the fate of the Saints Row franchise, as mentioned, we do know that a new Saints Row game, not necessarily called Saints Row 5, because, um, but we know it's a brand new one. It could be maybe a continuity reboot. You know how these things go. Mm -hmm. But we also know that... Um, the game will not be at E3, or at least not at the Cock Media uh, thing. I, I guess that's technically Summer Game Fest, but, you know, unless it's showing up on another stream, it's not showing up at E3. So, um, as far as uh, the quality of the games, I even I enjoyed Saints Row 3rd, uh, the 3rd, and Saints Row 4. Even Gat from Hell, although... You know, that's definitely, you know, that's only uh, like an 8 to 10 hour game. You know, maybe that's more what you're looking for. But I wouldn't say Gat from Hell is a good starting point for the franchise. Um, mainly because it is meant to be an ending to Saints Row 4. Um, and as far as where to start, I'd actually say Saints Row the 3rd because it did get a remastering. Apparently a really good one. 
I just have mm. never felt the need to pick that up because, you know, I have the old one, and the old one was fine. Like, you know, it, it's not a game that really needed updating as opposed to the first two. Mm-hmm. Now, also worth noting, don't pick up Saints Row the Third on the Nintendo Switch. It's one of the worst ports to the system. Um, I'm shocked. I think I think Saints Row 4 might have fared better. I, I didn't really pay attention to that one. I do remember, like, Saints Row the Third had a lot of fucking technical problems. It had frame rates, um, you know, a lot of technical glitches. It was just badly ported. Um, anyway, so, yeah, that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Uh, the week ahead. So, no Friday show this week. Um, because, well... E3 is upon us, <laughs> and we've been working out and sussing about uh, to what to cover, and I think we've narrowed it down to these, you know, either like a platform holder or the companies we care about. So the tentative list at this point is Xbox and Bethesda, Square Enix, uh, Capcom, Nintendo Direct, and Bandai Namco. And as far as the configurations, uh, you know, that depends on schedules. Um, So, you know, um, once again, we are expecting a new episode of Last News Desk, but, you know, Max still hasn't shown up, but he's got 20 minutes, so we'll see what rolls out there. Uh, But until then, I shall wish you good gaming.